I notice that as I age and develop and such that the size and complexity of my problems get bigger and bigger and to some extent I notice that it's not like I didn't have these problems before usually but it's more that I just notice them as I develop more as if my scope of consciousness expands to allow me to see certain things that you know, need to be fixed or improved or whatever. I guess it's um, that effect when you're learning something and you eventually think, oh, I'm getting good at this or I'm good at this or whatever. And then you learn some new rules and you start to think, oh, geez, okay, you mean this existed? You mean this is how it works or something like that? And you start to understand like, oh, okay, the world is a much larger place than I thought. And the best thing to do is simply just to adjust to it, to learn and fix, I mean, to, you know, to work on that. Ignoring problems isn't going to fix them most of the time. So it's better just to learn how to, you know, to fix them, etc. So I find this, it kind of relates to more and more responsibility, so to speak, um, or greater responsibility. As you get stronger and are able to handle more things, they will start to enter your scope, and that's when you can start to play around with them. And, you know, try to um, dip your feet into the shallow waters of whatever new issue or problem or new thing in life that has kind of come up to you. And eventually you, you know, get more acquainted with it and that basically converts into you gaining more power in the world or in yourself or whatever it happens to be. And then again, another larger problem will appear. I guess it makes me look at like kings, for example, or you know, rulers and such. People who own maybe companies or, or countries or is a house homeowner even the, the, the scope of problem is larger like if you're, you're a king it's a very large scope now of course you're not you're not on the ground doing as much leg work as much you know constructive work there but you're more just commanding it's a very high position of you know problem solving or being a homeowner is a smaller position of a, problem solving. Being maybe a business owner or a manager or something is a kind of in the middle, I guess you could say. Mm. Anyway, I guess I'll leave that one here. So the kind of food you eat has an effect on you and your body, and it relates to certain different parts of you. You can understand food mostly in this way. If we, for example, take an animal, the parts of the animal that relate to us is what is going to be enhanced or healed or given nutrients. Of course, the whole body is given nutrients, but for example, if you eat the liver, your liver is more stimulated. If you eat the heart, your heart is more stimulated. Well, if you eat the feet of an animal or the hands or the head or something, equally you will be stimulated in this way. Now there are some animal or animal-like things like mollusks for example, an oyster or a abalone or a clam. And these things have a biology which resembles nature. Everything resembles nature you could say. Um, but you could see like the bottom of the you know, the, the whatever it happens to be, the muscle or whatever, or the top of it is kind of related to like the head and, you know, the lower body. And depending on what part you eat will be what, um, you know, how you get stimulated. While the shell, for example, if you were to grind up the shell and process it to make it edible, technically I think the, the shells are semi-edible or they're semi-toxic. Um, so you this I guess it's something semi-toxic that means it's semi-edible, right? <laughs> I mean like I kind of 
anything's edible if you, you know, you stretch your imagination enough. So the shells would be like the hardest, densest part where there's the most amount of nutrients. Um, but it's the least amount of bio bioavailable or quick or organic nutrients. It's, it's kind of like eating rocks. Uh, a bunch of ore probably has more minerals than a bunch of muscle, but the muscle is a lot easier to, pr to you know, digest and eat. It's the same way that plants, um, plant food is less digestible than animal. Uh, you know, meat, organs, etc. And then minerals are less digestible than plants. For all that it matters, you could live off rocks or you could live off bark. Again, bark is the most dense part usually of a, of a tree. Well, the bones of an animal, that's kind of like, you know, the densest part. So again, everything separates into densities. If you can understand densities, you can understand that minerals, plants, and animals separate into densities, and then you can understand that the body of an animal separates into densities. The, the, the you know, the feet or the lowest part is like the hot, the most dense, and then the, the head is the least dense. Practically, it doesn't exactly work that way. If we're going to you know weigh organs and, and upper skeletal and lower skeletal but you kind of get the idea Na this is just nature expressing itself it's just frequency made physical in a, in a kind of acidic way to put it so you have to process minerals most minerals at least to eat them properly similarly you have to process some um, plants to eat them properly and you know if you cook something you make it more uh, you remove some of the solidified kind of nutrients and you kind of make that more volatile you remove some of the nutrients but it's easier to eat so to speak it's like meat if you've ever chewed raw meat you know it's not exactly easy to do um, for that matter or it's not exactly the most palatable thing so again cooking it reduces nutrients but makes it more digestible and easy to eat again so getting back to things like relations yeah, so, um, sea, there's, okay, so there's seafood, there's land food, there is, uh, sky food, which, sky food's like birds, land food is, you know, cows, pigs, uh, chickens, anything that walks on the land, and then, and seafood, you know, fish, mollusks, um, etc., and if we're going to talk vegetables, you know, seaweed, or sea minerals, you know, corals, pearls, etc. On the land would be, you know, all the plants and fruits, etc. Yeah, excuse me, etc. And then in the air, that's high altitude herbs, um, things here yeah, that grow up in the, you know, the higher altitudes. Birds, for example, anything that's up in a tree. Um, I guess you could kind of say like a possum, which. Uh, I think a raccoon is kind of the equivalent, maybe in some abstract stretch of the imagination. Maybe a possum is kind of like a, a heavenly rat or some kind of upper but lesser creature, like a lesser creature of the upper realms. I don't know. Monkey, you know, if you cook up a like a chimp, one of those ones that that um, you know swings around in the trees or whatever, you get more quote-unquote heavenly or upper energy really it just means that you know the upper things are lighter the lower things are usually heavier um, the, the the sea it relates to the, the the water organs and the I imagine the birds would relate to the lungs and the chest I mean if you think about it a bird has a very pronounced chest that's one thing a bird has because they're flying around all the time so it would kind of reason that if you eat a lot of birds you get a more pronounced chest right I don't know if you eat a lot of seafood you get more pronounced maybe intuition maybe memory um, things that relate to water you know fertility and then 
and then land animals is more like muscle and bone and you know structure and fit and, and such and figure and then you've got to think about is the creature a male or a female um, because again all of that that estrogen and testosterone is basically crystallized in the body transforming it into you know the male or the female form most animals that we eat if not like 99 percent are probably female i think that has a significant effect on us uh you know how much i really don't know but i think it definitely has an effect a feminizing effect uh, to some degree or to quite a decent degree Similarly, if we would eat all male animals, that would have a very masculinizing effect on us, I believe. So anyway, that, that summarizes things. You probably get the point. Eat things in relation to what you wish to develop or what you need to heal and help. Or just understand that whatever you're eating has a relation to your body and it has an effect. Um, kind of like a medicine or a drug or a supplement or whatever. So, every so often I think about the idea that eventually I'm going to hit a point where I just kind of know everything, and you will as well. It's just like fate, I guess you could say. If, you know, we assume reincarnation is real, eventually everyone will know everything, or you know, so to speak. Of course, life's kind of infinite, so it's like you have to pick a specialty, but what I really mean is like, you know, society and life's kind of complicated nowadays it wasn't as complicated in the past but still realistically eventually you know we're gonna figure things out like i'm still trying to figure out how to adult quote unquote you know how to like fit in with society make money uh, you know, get a house and get family and do all this stuff and like i i i've hardly taken many steps in any of this you know it's, it's hard work, you know, it's complicated in, in today's world, but eventually I'm going to get it, you know. Eventually I'm going to understand how to fix a house enough that I can, like, maintain it. Eventually I'm just going to understand how to, like, make a garden, you know. My, eventually my vegetables will look good and, and taste good and be good, you know. Eventually things will work out because you just do it every year you learn a bit more and you learn a bit more and that's what I mean like eventually we're just gonna figure life out and be at a point where we're, we're good we're kind of cruising along <clears throat> and the nature of life is always to is always to like seek a it's like harmony between chaos and order understanding life is too much order Life doesn't like to be understood. It's a little bit, it has a, maybe a bit of a personality disorder, I'm not sure. Um, side note, you ever notice when like you you give up, then, then life's kind of like, no, please, please, here, here's that thing that you wanted, or here's that like, here's, here's like this piece of help. And then when you're like grinding hard, it's the opposites like no oh, fuck you ain't giving you shit you're not you're not you're not doing this you're not learning this you're not you know, nothing's gonna work for you and then you give up and it's like oh no 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 please 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 keep suffering in my in my infinite domain my torture dimension you know? and then you and then you you try again and then it gets gets all sundere i guess you could say in that way if you know what that means <laughs> anyway that's kind of relating to this but so what i mean is like Eventually, we're going to hit a point where we just kind of know things like, why is someone sick? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's because of this. You know, why is someone poor? Again, it's because of this. Uh, why is this, this? And you can fix it all and get to a point where not only do you know it, but you can do it. You can, you can game life just the same way that if you play enough RuneScape, you just kind of get the gist of how things work. And yes, there are always new quests coming and sometimes new skills and sometimes new this or that, new zones or whatever. No, honestly, I'm 
solidly play RuneScape in like 10 years, so I don't really, you know, <laughs> I don't know how true that is. But at least, you know, you play World of Warcraft or whatever, there's all that stuff. Yes, there's a new expansion every couple of years, but ultimately you kind of learn how to do it. You learn that it's, it's quicker to use hotkeys. You learn to enable, like, all the extra action bars when you first play, you know, you, you, you learn what add-ons you like, you learn the dungeons and, and what kind of classes you like and just, you know how to make money would, you know, general extent or basic extent on that. You just kind of know how to do things. I think life is the same where eventually you just get to a point where you just kind of know how to make money. You just kind of know how to talk to people, you know, if you want to get a uh, wife or husband or whatever, you can kind of do that. You just know how to talk to people and navigate you know, family situation. You just know how to build shit, how to raise animals and plants and how to travel and all. You just kind of know how to do everything. And um, the question then is what happens then? You know, do you just live your life just being able to, you know, enjoy yourself? Because that sounds too good to be true. I, I get the feeling that once you kind of master is a strong word but let's just say once you master the, the generic level of life you then go up to the next level and that could just be you become like a, 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 a like a CEO of a com big company or you become like you know the, the father or mother of a big family or you know or the or grandmother of that or you take on some you know bigger physical role maybe you become some kind of um, I don't know great person on the internet you know if that's more your domain <clears throat> some some uh, great i don't know what it, whatever the fuck you want um is that kind of like the next level that when you when you finally you know learn that okay you gotta you know you gotta cook your food every day you gotta shower you know the really basic stuff you gotta you know don't, don't, don't do too many drugs, don't, you know, make sure to get some sleep, and finally, you're like, alright, maybe I can hold down a job now, you know, maybe, maybe I can, you know, save a little, maybe I can, you know, work on some things, you know, you slowly level up, level up, just eventually get to some level where, you know, like, partying with aliens, or, you go into, like, interdimensional, realms through I don't know you just you just like create a portal to another world and you just go to that next world and it's more complicated and it's kind of similar to this world but it's got like more angles more layers more levels and you know, more colors there are more tastes and smells and more senses and all that is that what happens or does life just get more complicated and harder and you have to learn more? I don't know. I feel like I'm slowly approaching the point where I kind of get things, but it's slow. Like maybe if I'm lucky in my mid-30s, I'll be like, okay, I can actually live like a normal person or when, when they were in their teens or maybe early 20s of like 100 years ago. Yay. Now, now it's time to actually live and not, you know, I don't know, be crushed by this ultra-weighted society. <laughs> now we've made this anti-life society, I guess you could say. That's really what it is. It's not made for life. It's made to uh, keep the peasants down and, you know, keep the richer I guess at the end of the day I don't know I feel like no one wins but maybe that's just because I haven't seen people who win no, that's all is it possible to replicate nature in the way of inception creation of animal life being both regular animals and humans I think it's very much possible. We've been able to recreate just about any process of nature. 
be that a more bacterial one, a growth of plants, generation and transmutation of minerals like that under the ground, and many other. I see no reason why it wouldn't be possible to create essentially artificial wounds and create somewhat artificial people or animals. Already cloning has been performed on animals and as far as I am aware probably humans as well. At least there are some companies which offer human cloning services if you look them up. I imagine as well, I've seen some images of a sheep grown in a bag in some kind of some kind of solution of, of liquids. If we analyze the idea of a womb, the soil or dirt is like an earth womb for plants. Plants grow, or their seed is taken into this earth. The earth is essentially an area of space which allows for nutrients and liquids to gather in. The seed is that which carries the, the path to giver. It's essentially like a clone, or a, I mean, I guess so. I guess it's like a, a clone of whatever gave it, just in a smaller form. And when you put this seed in the earth, it grows into a plant, as we can see. Similarly with a, an animal, an animal puts their dick into a, another animal's vagina, usually, and then releases a kind of fluid which goes into the deepest parts of the female animal. And then in the past, I believe if you look up Aristotle's ideas on conception, he said that the male, I think he said at least, that the male fluid and a female fluid mix. Maybe he didn't actually say that, but he's got some interesting ideas on, on things. I think actually he said that the woman is more just the carrier, that the, the man's seed is the important part mainly, and the woman is more the carrier of that. Um, nowadays, you know, through science, they say a baby is born of both half and half male and female um, or the, the mother and the father's genetics I should say. Now I don't really know how you know, true any of that stuff is. I've never proven it. <clears throat> Just the same way that I've never seen or proven that a little sperm enters an egg. I don't know how true that is and then multiplies. Well, we know that could just be some kind of CGI, but I'm not trying to disprove it or anything like that. Now, Paracelsus said um, that you could, well, he did apparently. I believe he took a horse or a cow, they used both of them actually, different alchemists did, and they would smear their. They came out essentially their sexual substance. Um, I don't know if it was on or inside of the um, vaginal canal or the outer region of a horse or cow vagina and led it to ferment. And I don't know if the horse or the cow is dead. I did hear that apparently they killed it after 40 days but maybe they killed it before and allowed the rotting of the animal to allow for heat and, and, and energetic, you know, spirit, essentially energy 
um, fuel the homunculus. Maybe if the animal was alive, it would reject it, its immune system. But again, what if your semen was strong enough to, you know, not be rejected? Is that a possibility? I don't know. Anyway, apparently they would feed it with blood. Um, from what I know, you know, if you look at common fertilizers, mostly nitrogen containing things, you could probably um, simmer down piss or blood and use that as a feeding kind of you know, nutrient solution. If you look at you know, urine, is very effective if watered down on, on plants. Um, amniotic fluid apparently is very close to urine, if not basically is, because you've got to think of babies, you know, urinating, defecating in there. It's also right next to the bladder and bowel, um, so it probably draws from you know, moisture and, and, and nutrients from those, you know, warmth at least. Um, you could also make some kind of amniotic fluid, but anyway, the alchemists would use blood. I think they would, I'm not sure if they would inject blood into the um, animal's womb or not. I think they would, but maybe once after 40 days uh, after the, the kind of strange baby-like thing was ready so to speak then they would put it into another container i believe and then start to feed it blood or some kind of nutrient solution uh, one thing i heard is this this mixture of all kinds of minerals was used now another method w was the idea of using meat probably minced meat mixing that with semen and putting that in a place that was warm. They used to use dung, which would decompose. You could probably use a water bath or some kind of you know, other thing. As long as it's not through the use of light, that probably won't do good. Uh, more darkness, probably. But they would you know, mix meat and semen and feed it blood and, uh, and in a warm location because the idea was that the meat was like a, a it's kind of like the soil, you know, an animal wound, so to speak, which is just, as they, they, their idea was it's just a material or substance or a space or something that offered you know, darkness, nutrition, heat. Um, so do you need a woman's sexual substance, the egg or something like that. Some ideas were there where they said that the woman's sexual fluid, which is the womb fluid essentially, that which she releases during her period, the menses, uh, was important or, or was one component if mixed with the male's fluid, sexual fluid, that together would form a child. So you could potentially try to do things mixing those or something if the the meat or, or the or if you can't create some kind of vat like a water vat with nutrients solution in it um, perfect for life and then just basically come into that vat keep it hot and um, see what happens. So I was working in the local city today. Not the big city, the big, big center city of the state, but the local, I don't know, what you'd call it, local town city or region city or whatever. Because the way that I see it is that you've got little corner shops or little just shops, you know, that you have every, every so often. And then you have a kind of conglomerate of shops, which is kind of like the the, the town or the local you know, village or whatever you'd say and then you've got um, like a big conglomerate of shops 
this isn't just your local supermarket and you know food shop and maybe like a clothing shop whatever this is all kinds of you know leisure and all that stuff <clears throat> and then you have the city which is just shop upon it's just a you know blocks upon blocks upon blocks upon blocks of, of shops and merchantry places and banks and all kinds of you know stuff like that pharmacies etc which is like the big big one but anyway I notice things go quicker there's a lot more energy things go quicker there's a lot more people uh, I'll be honest I like the slow more relaxed um, places because you know it's, it's a little hectic I guess <laughs> I'll put it that way if there's too much stuff going on but anyway it was an interesting experience and especially you know being there to work I was just delivering you know, food doing all that stuff um, I find it's easier to kind of know familiar people in a smaller town or a small city or whatever because you see them every day and um, you know you, you meet the locals or whatever well, the bigger one is a lot less that way. It's a lot more um, less in, less personal, I guess you could say in that way. I also noticed the, that the city is kind of like an artificial environment, as in, I guess you could say it's like a creation of people's minds or a conglomeration, which basically just means lots of things together created by people's minds that they've imagined whatever leisure and enjoyment places, restaurants, whatever. Um, there was a dark side of the city that I noticed, which was the medical areas. The medical areas had a strange aura to them. It felt very dark and very evil and all that, you know, all the testing centers and all this stuff. Um, I delivered to one of the, the, the local hospital and I, I didn't go in, I, I don't think I could have because every you had to wear a mask, you had to do all this crap and I'm not doing that, you know. Um, but there's a strange aura around it, it felt, felt very, um, I don't know, I, I feel uncomfortable around any kind of government um, structured area. Something about car parking, you know, and all these like, like multiple stories and I don't know, it just feels that, you know, this isn't like my Chinese animes, I guess. It's kind of a feeling I get. But anyway, um, aside from that, yeah, it's interesting, I guess. Uh, I was kind of afraid to go up an elevator. And all these buttons, and I don't know which one to press. And, man, I guess that shows how, like, I'm not country or anything, but I'm suburban. A suburban area, you know, we have two floors in suburban areas. We have one floor, which is most people, and two floors, which is rich people. So that's about it for that. Um, mm, I guess there's a lot more money to be made near town, like bigger, the bigger the town, the more opportunity to make money, and the more kind of, you know, people and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's quicker, you know, quicker gained, quicker lost. It's like the people, you'll meet them quickly, you'll maybe um, have, you know, befriend them quickly, but you'll lose them quickly, you know, you'll disfriend them quickly. I figure it's that kind of vibe. So, um, it's just up to you what you want to do, you know, how, how you like to live, etc. So, you see this a lot where someone goes through their life, they're kind of, maybe they're like an, like an uncool or a nerd or whatever, and then they try to become more popular, or try to become more normal or whatever. And what I find a lot of the time is that they lose their sense of self. Or they lose what kind of made them feel special and then they just become another NPC normie. Usually it happens when people like enter the workforce or go to higher education and such, um, try to integrate more into society. 
Um, I always found like, just say if a woman is trying to kind of like match a very societal beauty standard or something like that, it's not very attractive personally. I see it as a shame um, when that happens, just because it's like they lost the thing that made them attractive. And I guess on the masculine front, you know, maybe a woman would say the same thing about a man. I don't know. Because um, at the end of the day, you know, not everyone likes this, you know, some kind of generic societal, cultural standard of beauty or... It's not even just attraction, it's, it's, it's also like a person is more interesting if they are more true to themselves and they're more unique, you know, the kind of art that person will make, the things they will speak about and such. But I guess a lot of people have a weak sense of self and then they um, get into a certain friend group, whatever, and they just want to fit in and they just take on the values of that group and then they lose themselves. Maybe that's why like, I guess the rare types of people and those who retained maybe the weird or the darker or the, the, the kind of outcast aspects. And that could be culture to culture, it could be different. So I guess there's similarities between them. You've always got the shaman, and the shaman's kind of the weirdo. Yeah, it's no good if the shaman tries to be the warrior or something, you know. There's nothing wrong with the warrior shaman, but at the end of the day, still should, you know, we keep them shamanic roots. I guess it's kind of like that. And anyway, maybe you've seen someone who's done that. Maybe you've, maybe you've been the person who did that. I guess this is a message to say, like, you don't have to, you know, change yourself for society or for others. You don't have to try to follow a generic path of what is expected or what is normal or whatever. Because you know? ultimately what is normal is what is kind of popular maybe or I don't know, common. And I guess what is common is just kind of what um, maybe some great person did or something like that, who knows? I guess it's kind of how you make a new like, trend or culture or whatever. Alright, so we have what we might think of as frequency. Frequency, I guess you could think of as speed. Speed of a wave, a wave being Right, some kind of pressure, I guess. And what I want to discuss is more related to people and our energy. You have people that are slow, people that are quick. Usually, as you are a child, when you are a child, you are quicker. And as you grow, you become slower. Similarly, if you are in a hotter climate, usually you are quicker. And if you're in a colder climate, usually you are slower. So slower force is, or energy, is more related to earth and water, while quicker is related to the air and fire. If you are slower, you live longer. Your body circulates slower. You grow slower. You are quicker, you grow quicker, you live quicker, you have more experiences, you rise and fall quicker, you make money and spend it quicker, your metabolism is quicker, etc. If you're slower, you sleep probably more, you eat more probably, you become more physical, if you're quicker, you become more spiritual. Quicker force is more chaotic, slower is more methodical and structured, more rigid. 
you can kind of think that if you just say you're in the middle and then you're trying to summon more chaos, you summon more of this positive, this quicker energy. And eventually, it's kind of like a city. Anything can happen in the city. But out in the country, probably not many things happen. You might see an animal, the wind might blow the trees, you might see some bugs, maybe it rains, maybe it rains. It's pretty, you know, relaxed. So the slower things get, the more stable they become, the more you know, methodical and, and kind of calculated they can be. You can bridge absolute tension, relaxation, or speed and slowness in the middle. To say that absolute relaxation and slowness, that's kind of how you slow things down as so you relax. Usually the tension is what causes the, the, the heat and the quickness. And then absolute tension or absolute speed it then loops around, or so to speak, or it, or it feels like absolute slowness. An example is that if you want to do things quicker, one way is to go slower. It's, and I don't mean do it slow, I mean relax yourself, slow down your mind, reach a point of zen, and within that infinite field of relaxation. That is how you activate ultra speed. It's because you focus incredibly deep through that relaxation and slowing everything down. What then would you reach in a polar opposite in the tension or the speed? Maybe that's how you can mm, slow down quick things, I don't know, or speed up slow things. Mm, I don't know, I have to practice that, figure it out. Anyway, just some stuff to think about. So I think I've cracked the code. Firstly, as to essentially what is this thing which crystallizes uh, maybe you could think accomplishment or greatness or something for men that increases interest and status as they age secondly why is there so much bickering in the workplace um, about not being appreciated or you know kind of people what um it's it's like it relates to that quite quitting thing where people are like oh i do so much and i get nothing in return and i think that relates to women in the workplace so this is a dual thing of essentially how how work and status hierarchies and such affect both men and women first we'll start off with men so simply put as a man the younger you are, generally, the lower you are in the eye of society. You have less status, you have less wealth. Women see you as lesser. I notice as I age, women look at me in a nicer way. Um, I start to gain more status. Now, I think it is because inherently you're, you're improving your inherent nature as you age you know men get stronger smarter etc but also you're, you're gaining more accomplishments and you're stacking up these accomplishments you're stacking up these skills they gain you more status it's a bit like if you think follow account in social media well in real life it's more like people know you people remember like oh yeah that there's that guy he did that thing um, you know, your company will, will, companies will be like, okay, this guy has this amount of skills and he's proven it. So, you know, I'm going to hire him. Um, I think we, women subconsciously pick up on 
what you would think of as the inherent nature, firstly, as a man, as in, if a man is inherently better than another man because he's the stronger, smarter, more experienced, whatever, he will just have more oomph, more, more of like an energy, more of a power to it. I think women inherently first pick up on that. And then secondly, they'll pick up on things like, okay, this guy's the manager, his boss, so, you know, like if you pro tip, if you... Um, if you've never been a leader of anything, women magnetize to you. It's kind of like you're a little sun and everyone out and all the women are like planets. It's just an instant mag um, magnet of, of women, essentially. Uh, similarly, things that signal high status. If you've never driven a... a um, you know, I drove another person's car once because I had to bring it home from them and it's, you know, it's a sports car. It wasn't a super high level sports car, but it was definitely a sports car and the eyes were magnetizing. Now, personally, you know, being a more of a spiritual, being more of a soulful person, I see that as very disgusting. Um, so I don't really, you know, if a woman just goes for me because I'm in a certain location or position of status, uh, it's not very attractive. But of course, you need some kind of status, or so you need some kind of something to, you know, put yourself out there for people to be like, okay, this person's trustworthy, or whatever. So it's a, um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. But anyway, so to summarize, the main idea is that a man gains experience, gains skills, gain, does things, does projects, gets more of a work repertoire, you know, does more things and eventually this crystallizes more and more into status, into accomplishment and it further improves the inherent nature which is the core of them, right? This improves essentially your ability to make money, to gain a wife or women or whatever, to gain friends, um, basically everything. Now, let's flip it around for women. Women have been essentially told to don't have a family, don't don't live by your natural inclinations, because a man's natural inclinations is work, is doing things. Men have also been told not to live by those, which is why you don't see a lot of men, or as many men, you know, accomplishing things, and then you see a lot more women. At least in my generation, if you're around the age of you know, in your twenties, you will see more women working than men. You will see more women making more money than men, and I mean a lot more money. Women have been told. Women have been told to climb the hierarchy, to take on more jobs, more education, to get higher up and higher up. Now this is a this is a problem because men don't see women who are higher up in social hierarchies as more attractive. If anything, you become less attractive because, um, you know, I don't know about you, I want a wife, not a, you know, boss or manager or something. Um, if you're spending, you know, eight to 10 to 12 hours, five days a week, at some place, you're not really going to have much time for you know anything else. So it becomes a it becomes more of a negative. Now, women are I think they are beginning to notice this, which is what is where which is where this whole quiet quitting thing is coming from, because men know that they are tools of service in a workplace. Men have been objectified as tools. Yes, men have been objectified as tools. That's, that's a, a very important thing to understand. Um, you know, a lot of men are seen as tools, essentially, of function or functions of work. Of you know, you are a digger, you are a miner, you are a baker, you are this function of society of reality. That is the objectification of men. Uh, men realize this, they know this, they don't, you know, we don't, we don't want to work or like to work all that much or most, you know, if you're in a shitty job, but we have to. Women are, are kind of noticing this, that going higher up the status hierarchy doesn't make them happier. And I think it comes from an inherent desire of love. I think that's where it comes from. I think a lot of women are starved of love, affection, um, you know, 
appreciation, etc., and they think that going up the status hierarchy the same way a man would gain a love, appreciation, affection, etc., respect more so, I should say, because men is more based on respect than it is based on love, but, you know, it, respect is kind of a version of love. They think doing the masculine thing will get them that, and it doesn't. In fact, it gets them less. Um, and I think they are realizing this because the whole quiet quitting epidemic is very feminine, it's very emotional, um, in a feminine way, because of course men have emotions in a masculine way. It's very much like, why am I not appreciated? Why am I not respected? Why am I, why, why am I not loved you know, for doing more? It's very feminine. And I think the whole thing is basically women figuring out that you getting a high level job, you becoming a doctor or, or a scientist or a politician does not mean you're going to be loved and respected the way that you would like to have been in a social setting, like having a family, um, you know, having children, having you know, grandparents or, or, or cousins or something around you who respect you for being a great woman of the family or whatever. Um, or having maybe animals, you know, around you and such. I think that's what they're starting to realize. And I think that's when women go to around, when they get to around 28 to 35, that's like the, that's like the cliff where they all start quitting their jobs and or, or downgrading their ideas of status. And the opposite happens with men. That's when men start getting into their, that's when they actually start getting into the job that they were more meant for. That's when they start getting, you know, beginning the journey. Because again, they're not at the top yet. They're literally at the bottom at that point, but they found the bottom of the mountain which they want to climb which is important because if you know where the trail is you know how to or you basically you're, you're on the right path finding the path is is really it's half the the battle walking the path is the other half the battle so it's around that age you know, 28 is when women finalize their um physical maturity while well, 32 is when men finalize their physical maturity so around 32 for men is when they start to reach that point when 28 is when women start to it's also when fertility starts to drop off. Now, this is an important part. 28 is when a woman's health and fertility usually will start to drop off, you know, as I said, the cliff. Um, men, it's 32. Now, men's drop off is slower because um, they have longer cycles. We have eight year cycles and women have seven year cycles, so it's a little bit slower. And usually because men are more physical, men take care of their health, at least in today's society more. Um, there's nothing stopping a woman from taking care of her health, you know, being very healthy and then still having fertility in her early to mid thirties, um, especially if she's already had children, there's nothing really stopping her. The same way if a man's healthy, he can have children, you know, to his early forties. Um, maybe mid 40s you're maybe um of course if you it's not like you fundamentally can't it's just you know i'm trying to say beyond that point it's a bit you know it's you kind of you're rolling the dice in quite a fair bit that's if you're healthy you're very healthy there's nothing to stop you from doing that um so the whole work status thing it relates again to physical development and fertility because fertility is kind of inherent energy as it you know when you're young when you're a teenager you've got all that energy to do things that's when you're meant to be developing yourself learning skills um doing things when you have all that energy leaving it till later is a bit it's difficult because you don't have as much energy anymore you don't have as much you know, power force pushing forward um, I noticed that when I got 24, because it got to 24, because 24 is a new cycle, uh, 24, 32, those are, you know, and, and 16 and 8 for men, um, those are younger ones. When I got to 24, it was like, okay, things have slowed down quite a bit, they've crystallized quite a bit, you know, I'm no longer a teenager, that, that 16 and 24 is kind of that, that quick, energetic, 
teenager young male phase for a man um and i, I figured yeah i'm really no longer in that um anymore and um things have changed anyway i, I think i've probably probably made this long enough but to summarize i think society's switching now where men will be going back to seeking status and hierarchy and climbing the ladder and women will be less wanting to do that they've, they've kind of figured out at least the ones that went through it that feminism is a lie and it's you know poisoned the well um so to speak and that you can't gain love and respect and, and all this stuff from status and working as a woman and as a man the way you do gain respect love status appreciation etc is through gaining status and you gain status from achievements from doing things or from inherent nature which is improved from doing things uh, you know putting out a video like this is a way to improve my inherent nature imp inherent speech it might gain me more status you know in the way of subscribers and eyes and all that it's, it's whatever you do is what you do working out in the gym um, going to work going for a walk for all that matters it's just and even the rest part the rest part is also important you need to rest so that you can do right so it's all important it's all part of the package but anyway take that for what it is